This is Duke University. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the kickoff talk for the reunion weekend. My name is Michelle Nolan, and I'm a supervising attorney in the uh, Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. I work with Reich Longest, who's the director, and I am a proud Duke alumna of uh, 1992, so it's very ha good to be back here with all of you and celebrating my own reunion this year, too. Um, I wanted to, um, we're going to be talking with uh, John and Patricia Adams and Jim and Brenda Mormon about uh, the origins of environmental law in this country. Um, but before, I wanted to just uh, offer some uh, overview and try to set up the discussion. Uh, Reich's going to do a, an informal interview and talk um, with these folks for you. Um, I came here in 1989 to pursue a career in environmental law. I was inspired to do so by reading all um, in the newspapers, the country's leading newspapers, about all the amazing work that the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund and the Natural Resources Defense Council were doing. And I had already thought that I would like to come to law school, but the idea of pursuing a career actually in environmental law was new to me until I read those uh, those uh, articles and thought that it would be wonderful to be able to participate in such a career and have such a meaningful impact on, on the world. I was fortunate enough as a student here to become acquainted with um, Jim Mormon and John Adams. Um, some friends of mine and I started the Environmental Law and Policy Forum, uh, I think what might be the nation's first in interdisciplinary environmental journal. And the two of them agreed graciously to serve on the Board of Advisors and helped us uh, solicit articles and get that uh, journal established. NRDC continues to inspire all of our students, as does uh, Earth Justice, the modern incarnation of the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. And students come here, they work in our clinic to try to get a grounding in this area of law and um, follow in the footsteps of these two luminaries. But first I'd like to dial it back to 1962 when um, both Jim and John graduated <coughs> from Duke Law School. We had, a, at that point in time, a society that was going through a lot of turmoil and people starting to uh, challenge traditional notions of authority, uh, traditional notions of governance, and holding the government accountable for things that were happening in the community. One of the groundbreaking um, exposés during that time was the publication of Silent Spring by a biologist named Rachel Carson who challenged the government's uh, negligence in regulating pesticides and pointing out the deleterious effect that those pesticides were having, not only on our natural world, but also on human health itself. That led to a fundamental reorganization of how our environmental laws were to be applied and enforced. And I dare say that none of that would have come to fruition without the likes of Jim and John and the organizations they helped establish um, after their graduation. Jim went on to serve as the founding director of the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund and then went on to the U.S. Department of Justice after that under President Carter and served as the head of its Land and Natural Resources Division. Many of our students covet positions within this federal agency trying to get hired on as honors attorneys after they graduate from here. And we have two such uh, clinical graduates now and another student who will be coming up and joining their ranks in the fall. After John graduated from Duke, he went on to work at the office of the U.S. Attorney in Manhattan, and then seven years later left that position. He and Patricia took enormous personal risk, leaving that secure position with two children in tow and founding an organization that at the point of its founding did not even have a budget to be able to pay the salaries of its founding director. It was uh, quite an act of courage and bravery and foresight. The two of them nurtured and grew NRDC into the global force that it is today. They changed the legal profession and indeed changed the world. I've often thought now that I'm here um, uh, teaching environmental law, I wonder what an environmental law textbook would actually look like without some of the groundbreaking cases that the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund <coughs> and NRDC brought, things that established the very principles of standing, the magnitude and reach of the Clean Air Act, paving the way for regulation of toxic chemicals such as mercury in our environment, and also laying the predicate for regulating carbon as a greenhouse gas. There have been many other examples, too, too many to enumerate here. 
But it's little wonder that President Obama has conferred upon John Adams the highest civilian honor this country has to offer, the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And it's an honor well-deserved, um, earned over the course of a career dedicated to protecting the natural resources that not only fuel our economy, but also give inspiration to many ordinary citizens as well as poets and artists and writers. These couples exemplify the Duke University motto of knowledge and service of society. They've decided together to make personal sacrifices in pursuit of betterment of our society and changing the rule of law in this country. They've written numerous books, articles about their travels and their experiences, as well as leading to groundbreaking litigation. We're fortunate to have them here to talk about their experiences in creating um, these organizations and to talk about their new book, um, A Force for Nature. But before I turn it over to Reich, I just want to um, highlight for you some of the lessons that I gleaned from the book itself and how we are trying to apply those same lessons here in the work that we do um, with our clients and with our students at the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. First and foremost is that environmental law is n interdisciplinary in nature. It calls not only from the professions of law, but also necessarily the professions of government, uh, policy, economics, and of course science. The Environmental Law and Policy Clinic is interdisciplinary, one of the few interdisciplinary clinics in the country. And we are lucky to have students from the Nicholas School of the Environment join our ranks, bringing their expertise in economics, policy, and various scientific disciplines um, to benefit the, the, the work that the clinic does, and to be able to educate the law students here how to work across disciplines, understanding the professional uh, ethical responsibilities and limitations of other disciplines when they come into the field of law. One of the other lessons that I gleaned from the book was to listen to your adversaries, engage them, because they don't really want that much uh, different from what you want and your clients want. And if you can listen to them, you can come to mutually beneficial solutions. That's something that we've tried to teach our students and we've tried to work with our clients to achieve here in the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. A good example of that is a lawsuit that we brought against the state of North Carolina challenging fishing regulations um, and the illegal bycatch um, of protected uh, marine resources such as uh, sea turtles and other marine mammals um, that are endangered and protected under the uh, Federal Endangered Species Act. Working together with the Division of Marine Fisheries and with uh, the commercial fishing industry, we were able to work together to redesign uh, fishing gear to be able to better catch the target fish that they wanted for market while also significantly reducing the impact that that fishery had on uh, sea turtles. And that is now serving as a model throughout the country of a more beneficial and productive way of both allowing an economically productive fisheries within the states while still protecting our um, natural resources. Engage the business community in the work that you do. This is something that our clinic has tried to do working in conjunction with students from the business school and from the Nicholas School. Um, developing a guide to a green economy and providing recommendations for the current gubernatorial administration here in North Carolina on ways to develop clean energy sources that will protect the very natural resources that make North Carolina such a desirable place to live and work. One of the other lessons is that the environment is a global concern. And indeed, in our clinic, we've been able to enjoy the experiences and perspectives of students from all over the world, uh, LLM students who come here to get a degree in, environment, uh, excuse me, in uh, American law, who are practicing lawyers in other countries, also will come and share their expertise with us within the clinic and learn the American legal system and how to work with, um, within our very novel uh, legal system that allows us to challenge the government directly in the court. We've enjoyed students from Brazil, from Hong Kong, from England, and from Ukraine in the years that our clinic has been established. And so very much trying to make sure that we're engaging that global community as we provide service to the students here at Duke and to the North Carolina environmental community. And the last lesson that I'd like to leave with is that to <coughs> maintain this type of groundbreaking work, requires stick to and stamina, sometimes over the course of years or even decades to make sure that what you've begun, you're able to see through to its finish. Here at the clinic, we do have two several large uh, pieces of work that we're doing. Um, one challenging uh, historic contamination from a set of hydropower dams operated by the Alcoa Aluminum Company in Western North Carolina. 
and one challenging the location of a uh, Portland cement kiln and facility that would destroy more than 1,000 acres of wetlands in an uh, environmentally and culturally sensitive area of eastern North Carolina. Both of these pieces of litigation require a deep bench, a lot of expertise, um, and uh, the determination and dedication of our students as well as our faculty. So with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Reich and uh, introduce to you uh, John and Patricia Adams and Jim and Brenda Mormon. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle, for that overview. And um, we're going to start trying to, as a, more or less an interview, and then we're going to try and enlarge that into more of a broader discussion about the history of environmental law and its future. Where, where we've been and where we're going, the past as prologue. And um, I'm going to start with a few questions to Patricia Adams um, about uh, her experiences growing up here in the North Carolina mountains. And I'd just like for you to tell a little bit about what your father did for a living and what it was like for you growing up uh, in that house and, and in that location up in North Carolina's mountains. Yeah, I grew up in western North Carolina, actually in Asheville, but uh, our, my father was with the U.S. Forest Service. And uh, we had a cabin in the Nantahala National Forest on land that had been in my mother's family for many generations, and it was a log cabin. And my father was also a Boy Scout leader. So I grew up with this great sense of the wilderness uh, that was the wilderness for me was almost divine, and my father would quote Robert Service and say, can't you hear the wild? It's calling you. It was a very romantic notion, of course, but I was a child then. But I did, it was something that was just in my soul that the mountains were, and wilderness was something sacred and to be protected. And I, I, of the Mormons are over here. We have um, Jim and Brenda Mormon, and I have discovered that they are also North Carolinians. And so would you mind, I, I have a wired mic there for you. If you wouldn't mind just talking a little bit about what was your experience growing up in uh, Rutherford County in Rutherfordton? Well, uh, it's interesting. We could see the mountains. We weren't in the mountains. Right. But actually, from this little town of about 2,000 people, there have been about four or five people who have gotten very much involved in the environment from very early on. So we're often asked, was there something in the water in Rutherford <laughs> that this happened? But I think it was probably just the beauty of Western North Carolina and certainly uh, Patricia mentioned her father was a scout leader. For people who were involved in that kind of thing, you got out, you went hiking. It was just a natural part. You wanted to preserve it. That, that was certainly my experience. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I'm going to stand on that for the moment. OK, that's fine. It, sometimes the most eloquence is silence. It's a lesson that we try and teach our students, and I, my wife is constantly trying to teach me. So if I say too much today, I'm going to try and mind, remind myself of that good advice. But the, this this connection to the outdoors is something that you shared as well, John. Although you were coming at it from growing up in the Catskills, you want to share a little bit about what it was like for you? Yeah, I was a farm boy. We grew. I grew up on a little dairy farm in uh, in Calicoon Center, uh, over towards the Delaware River, and uh, we had cows and chickens and a couple of hundred acres, and uh, the nearest uh, uh, kid was three miles. So I spent more time with uh, an old horse and, uh, and a calf that I got from 4-H than I did with uh, any of my neighbors until I left for high school. So you think of New York as, uh, you know, a, a megalopolis, but there's a lot of rural places, and we found one to live in. And then after you left Duke Law School, you then went to the big city, and you were, uh, you were up there. I want to, and there was, there's a great uh, anecdote, and for any of you who haven't picked one up uh, as part of your attendance here today, this is, this is the manuscript. Um, so feel free to pick one up on the way out if you didn't pick one up on the way in. But there's a great, uh, a great anecdote in there I wanted you to expand on a little bit. At the very beginning, you talk about this experience of eating a liverwurst sandwich and looking out on the Hudson River. And at that time, the Hudson River was not quite the, um, the, the place that it is today. Would you tell a little bit about that experience and, and what it did for you? Yeah, well, that was when I had left to uh, Wall Street, where I had worked for a couple of years, uh, and was at the US Attorney's Office. And one of the things we did at lunch was walk down to the battery, and we would have a bad lunch, and we'd sit there. And on this particular day, they must have released the flow from one of the sewage treatment plants, and remember, no money had been put into sewage treatment in any of the rivers in the country in, uh, at that point, and a flow went by that was just absolutely astounding. And that was one of the things that uh, convinced me when the opportunity came along to start NRDC, along with Patricia's view 
of the soot on our children's forehead and air pollution that was so bad in New York City that it was really uh, largely due to incinerators and uh, uncontrolled uh, uh, emissions. So it really played a big part of my role, but it was also symbolic, and it was a good start to the story. Yeah. It, was, it certainly was visceral. When, I, when we teach students about how to, how to talk and connect to people, we always talk about what is a visceral image, and that was a visceral image for me. It really got me going. It also reflects on my eating habits. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes into another story, that one about networking. I mean, it's really interesting to me not only that um, that, as you pointed out, two pe four people from Rutherfordton, but that we have this group of folks from Duke Law, same class here, who've been so instrumental yeah. in the development of environmental law. And we uh, learned through the book and then learned a little bit more subsequent to that about experiences that you all had over dinner, the four of you, just uh, drinking cheap wine and eating spaghetti and talking about the issues of the day, which at that time were the headlines that of uh, deforestation, of cutting down of redwoods, clear cutting, and so forth. Um, I wondered if I'm going to start with you, Jim, and look, talk a little bit about what it was like over those dinner discussions that you all had. Uh, well, uh, get, get yeah. this. I, I, uh, uh, we were all interested in the same things because we actually got an old farmhouse together up in the Catskills. In fact, I was thinking how simple mortgages were in those days. <laughs> For $8,000, we got this farmhouse, and all we had to sign was a note and a mortgage. And Brenda actually had some money squirreled away so to make the down payment. <laughs> so we had like for two thousand dollars we got this thing and the Catskills very interesting because for many years like the Adirondacks the state of New York has been buying land there which is under some constitutional state constitutional provision of forever wild and and so um, and it, and and I know that John has over the years helped uh, uh, push that program even along further. So I don't know how many million acres and hundreds of thousands of Catskills have been preserved by the state of New York, but it's unprecedented in, for state government. And that was, and, and, uh, and, and being up there and preserving the Catskills and other things were things we discovered. And also I might mention when we were living in New York, I discovered the Sierra Club and I discovered there was a man in New York named David Sive, a lawyer who was chairman of the Atlantic chapter of the Sierra Club, which was everything east of the Mississippi. And he was bringing a lawsuit on behalf of something called the Scenic Hudson Preservation Conference to stop a pump storage plant from being built in a very scenic mountain on the Hudson called Storm King. And Brenda actually went and did volunteer work for Scenic Hudson, and we became aware for the first time that someone could actually bring a suit on behalf of environmentalists uh, for a matter. That case of ultimately got a ruling from the Court of Appeals uh, 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 holding that the citizens could bring such a suit because the government and the FPC took the position they didn't have standing, and that became a landmark decision. And just to follow up, one question on that is you'd also relayed to me that um, shortly thereafter you'd been uh, asked about whether or not you'd be interested in joining a public interest law firm, and your response was? Oh, well, okay. Um, after New York, I went to Washington. Brenda and I went to Washington. I worked for the environment, and we're now the Environment and Natural Resources, then the Lands and Natural Resources right. Division of the Justice Department. So I was doing things sort of of an environmental nature for the government. And one day I got a phone call from a fellow who asked me if I would be interested in leaving and joining um, a, a public interest law firm and be the environmental lawyer for it. And my answer to the question was, what's an environmental law firm? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I shall say that the environmental law firm uh, it was a public interest law firm. It was a public interest law firm. It was called the Center for Law and Social Policy. Originally, they were going to call it the Center for Law and Policy, but they didn't like the acronym after they, if you think about it, you'll see why. <laughs> uh, so it, they threw in a social. And this was a, this uh, organization, which still exists, but I don't think it does environmental law anymore, was also a clinical legal education thing. They brought uh, law students from five law schools came and spent a year there. And they were 
all smarter than I was, I'll tell you that. They came from Yale and Michigan, Penn, uh, Stanford, and I forgot, I, I forgotten what the fifth one was. And all of the things that we did there uh, were discussed ad nauseum with these students. And I, I must tell you, it was great for them, it was great for us. You want to talk a little bit about how you came into moving from Wall Street into public interest environmental law? It was you, In the book, you detail some very interesting um, foundational stories about how all that came about. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, I think the start was the Storm King case, and uh, we, I think Patricia and I both agree that uh, Brenda brought that to our attention very early on. Uh, and then we had two children and then a third, and uh, we really were, uh, we're living in the village, and it was really an air pollution scene, and that was true of all the big cities, and uh, so uh, as we were trying to raise these uh, little children and think about our future, we thought about moving up and buying a farm and practicing law in some small town, and Patricia would take care of the farm, and I would be a gentleman lawyer in, right. <laughs> in Calicoon Center. Uh, but w really what happened, uh, I was at the U.S. Attorney's Office, and this movement was starting, and it, we were talking about it up in the Beaverkill, where our farm is, uh, Gary was working on, uh, Gary Powers was working on planning issues, and uh, Tom Davidson and his family would come up. I mean, the, the family of Duke from our class was really very large, and, uh, and they came to New York, and we all, we all spent time talking about a lot of things, and, and this issue became very important. So while at the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, I was asked, would I be willing to leave the U.S. Attorney's Office and try to start a public interest law firm by some of the principles of Scenic Hudson, who had been working for almost a decade fighting Con Edison, trying to stop them from building this pump storage. Uh, and, uh, and we thought about it, and uh, it's true there was no salary yet, but uh, it really looked like something that suited me. You know, I'll just interject that they told John they thought a salary of $25,000 sounded pretty good. And his job, was, first job was to raise that money. <laughs> <laughs> so then the next thing that happened, and, and probably the most important thing that happened, is uh, we went to Ford Foundation, asked if uh, Ford would be interested in public, we knew they were interested in public service law. Would they be interested in environmental law? And they had a great interest in it. And, they, and uh, McGeorge Bundy specifically said, uh, you know, a year ago we had five young lawyers from Yale, several Rhodes Scholars clerking on the Supreme Court, and uh, we turned them down because they didn't have any aged, more aged, seasoned leadership. And, uh, they, and he, they suggested that if we met with them and talked with them, and we could put together a merger of the two organizations, the seasoned Wall Street lawyers who were building NRDC and hiring me, and the five young lawyers and joined by a sixth. Uh, and so we met, and I won't go into the details of how hard it was to pull it off, but it was two eras colliding, the 60s era, and we were I was over, Patricia, what is it, over, over 30 Well, years. you remember that was the, the decade of don't trust anyone over 30, and John was 34. <laughs> so we actually, we, we were able to put that together, and uh, you know, uh, it was a wonderful collection of people, including Gus Speth, who many of you know is a legal scholar and environmental hero, uh, and others equal to him, including now Secretary of Commerce Bryson, uh, and, uh, and the team of people that we were able to put together in 1970, just as all the environmental laws were being written, was in, unbelievable. And so we got in on the ground floor of every single statute that exists that we still today fight and protect. And we were able to help in the writing of those statutes, and we were able to help on writing the rules and regulations. And we like to think that we have more expertise on those statutes than anybody in the federal government because we've been at it longer with the same people. 
And that, that in the book, you point out how much a role NRDC played and Sierra, uh, Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund played as a shadow EPA during the 1970s, helping to helping those leadership at EPA to understand the scope of those laws and the scope of the challenge that was in front of them. You also mentioned how that sort of shifted and changed around the time of, let's say, the early 1980s. Uh, and so the role then uh, changed a little bit. And in the book, um, you talk about um, uh, the relationship that you developed with a fellow from Hollywood that some of us may have seen in some movies named Robert Redford. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you this very simple, maybe slightly provocative question. Who ultimately was more powerful, Robert Redford or Ann Gorsuch? You want to try to answer that? Well, I'll just start. We, we talked about that. You know, that's the negative and the positive. And nobody can deny in terms of an issue if you have a really bad guy out there and the Reagan administration and James Watt and, and Gorsuch were the bad guys at the time. You do, you're able to raise a lot of money to fight what they, they were really going to tear down the APA and really change things tremendously, as, as we know. Uh, Robert Redford, on the other hand, was a very positive force, and uh, he has been, he gave uh, the first benefit to NRDC, the first movie, and has been a man of intense integrity and commitment to this cause. There are celebrities who use a cause to enhance their celebrity, and uh, you got to be careful about that in, in these cause-oriented organizations. But Redford really used his celebrity to promote this cause, but you can go further back. No, I think that, that tells the okay. story. And I think reading through it, it was pretty clear that one of the things that was interesting was is that he wanted to engage the issues and fully understand them. Yeah. And also think about this strategy as opposed to just like you say, sort of flying in and saying, I heartily endorse this product or service and getting on a plane and going out. He's actually was engaged with the organization all the way through on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, he created an institution for resource management that he ran and funded for over 20 years that looked at environmental problems in detail, and he brought people in from every walk of life to work on those issues. So he really invested his, uh, his own fortune in it at uh, quite a large expense to him. At, shortly before that, and, I, and I, um, I hate to go back in time, but I realized I jumped over a, a period of time that I think is worth exploring a bit with Jim and Brenda, which was your tenure, after you left the Sierra Legal Defense Fund, you, you also went back to um, De Department of Justice and had leadership role within the Department of Justice and environmental law. Did you not during the, the Carter administration? You want to talk a little bit about that that time? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing that happened at that time when I was that, that's a the best job I ever had was being Assistant Attorney General because yeah. we had twenty I had twenty eight thousand cases and I could work on whatever one I wanted to, but it wasn't important <laughs> enough that I ever got in the press. So, <laughs> but. <laughs> so, a, a man named Tom Jorling, uh, who was then an assistant administrator at EPA and later became the head of concert of uh, environment in New York and then later a professor of law at, uh, well, uh, Williams. yes, Williams College, testified on the Hill one time that, that he had water and hazardous waste. He testified there were 30,000 un- uh, attended hazardous waste sites in America. And this made a huge flap in the press. And I thought, well, uh, EPA is going to want us to figure out how to bring a case on this. So I asked a fellow who worked for me, who some of you may know, Derwood Selke, who worked for me, mm -hmm. how can we bring a suit against the owners of a hazardous waste site? And he prepared this memo for me, and he went through all the possibilities. And then the assistant administrator of EPA, a woman named Barbara Blum, heard about this memo, and she called me up, and she said, Jim, I understand you have a memo on how we can sue people who have hazardous waste sites. And I, and I knew right away this was going to leak if I gave it to her, you know, our strategy. And I said, well, it's not finished yet, Barbara. And I can't, I must, I'll give it to you as soon as it's finished. And she said, all right. The next week, she held a press conference and said the Justice Department and EPA were going to file 50 suits that year against hazardous waste sites, <laughs> something she hadn't told us a thing about. Well, the, the Superfund law had not yet been enacted. There was a, a provision in, in, in a, uh, another law which we used, and we did, in Love Canal and all of those things that you, some of you have heard of and remember, we did manage to get 50 suits filed, and then when the Superfund law was passed, we amended the complaint and included them. It was quite a press, and uh, it was really, it was actually a lot of fun, and it was, it was probably one of the most important things we managed to do. 
Let me just say one thing about that period. Since NRDC was always suing the government and the Justice Department was defending it, we decided that maybe we better get out of that house together up in, <laughs> up in New York, so we did. <laughs> Yeah, that could have made for some interesting conversations yeah. over red wine, maybe a better quality <laughs> bottle. Um, the, um, so, well, that's a, that's a very good point, but it's one thing I think is delightful is how well you've been able to maintain your friendship over all these years, and, and that's a real testament to networking. One of the things, another theme that I uh, read throughout the book. I want to say something about that. There are no better friends than the Adams. <laughs> they, and other, and, and I, we won't be the only people who will tell you that. will tell you that, yeah. And, and that was one of the themes that I read through the book as a concurrent theme. The book is arranged primarily um, chronologically, but there's some thematic elements that are gone through it. Michelle's mentioned some of them. One I think is really critical is networking, and I mean that not in the cheesy I'm trying to sell you something sense. I mean it in the sense of actual work with the people that you like and developing close friendships with those people and developing ways to have an informal exchange. And their book is full of examples like that, where people become friends as a result of the work that they've done or, um, or, or end up working together because of their friendships. And then those friendships enhance the work that's done. And there's several examples of that in the book. Uh, I'm going to ask about at least one or two of them. One of them was in particular, you described this, this two individuals in, that you refer to as the dynamic duo. Yeah. Who were, would you talk, tell us a little bit about the dynamic duo, Patricia? Well, this was Al Meyerhoff and um, Laurie Mott in the California office in San Francisco. Al Meyerhoff had worked with migrant workers and farm workers and had on, on pesticide and health issues. And so when he came to NRDC, that was the area he wanted to focus on. Laurie Mott was a young mother. And at that time, there were a number of young mothers uh, working as attorneys and, and scientists at NRDC. And the studies had been done about what pesticides did, but most of the studies were done on a 160-pound adult male. And uh, Laurie I was thinking, well, what does this mean about my toddler who's only 30 pounds and who's eating these various vegetables? She first did a marketplace study. She literally went to the, the supermarket and got carrots and apples, and they took them to the lab, and they found all kinds of pesticides on them, as well as DDT still, even though it was no longer legal. So uh, through this study, it was the one element came out, and I know you, most of you have heard about this. It was Alar, which was put on apples to, keep them all, to make them ripen at the same time. When alar is heated, the ingredients break down, and one ingredient is something that's used to make rocket fuel. So, you know, that's not really good for a two-year-old. So that's what started this, this, this uh, uh, issue, and it became a, 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 a very public issue. And they were interviewed on 60 Minutes and uh, other uh, pro TV programs, and Meryl Streep joined the uh, team as a spokeswoman for the issue. It was the first foray into real public media, which was a little scary, and I think NRDC learned a lot at the time. But uh, in the end, they were proven correct. It wasn't a scare. It wasn't false. The Academy of Sciences and the World Health Organization both came in and, and agreed that Alar was not a good substance for little children. And they were, don't forget, consuming applesauce and apple juice much more than an adult male would anyway. So that, that was that, that case. I don't remember who it was that said it. Maybe you remember, John, but I remember reading in the book that they were talking about, in response to this backlash, you were talking to some folks, and I think one of them said to you something like, there's, there's only one thing in the middle of the road, or two things in the middle of the road. What, what were those, and who was it that said that, if you remember? Yeah, yeah Bill DeWint, and it was a skunk and a... A yellow line and a skunk. <laughs> and NRDC wasn't either one of those things. You were going to take a position one way or the other, so... No, I, it, it was very public, and we were sued by the apple growers for a lot of money, and in fact, there were a number of lawsuits brought, uh, and a lot of, there was a lot of risk involved at that stage for NRDC, and... Uh, it became a cause for business groups who claimed that we were uh, using scare tactics. And it has been used in business schools as a, an example of scare tactics and you know what, what's going on. On the other hand, uh, if you read about uh, the healthy food and organic food, you find that it's often considered the leading event leading to organic movement in this country, which makes me feel very proud of it. And uh, all of the agencies that were involved in regulating pesticides uh, ruled in our favor. And the, uh, the maker of Alar, uh, Uniroyal, pulled it from the market 
and it was banned from international markets by the World Health Organization. I just want to add, this was the first example of real consumer power, because young mothers all over America really rose up. Yeah. It was a grassroots movement, which was very powerful. And we see some, um, the, it, today, we see a lot of, um, of the impact on that on, in new business creation. Mm -hmm. In this area, in North Carolina, we see a tremendous interest in local food, and there is a real movement from a lot of um, alums and students at this university to integrate into the um, local food movement and to produce uh, healthy uh, alternative forms of agriculture and also direct to consumer, which allows farmers to be more profitable in many of these um, uh, economic arrangements right. than they previously could, producing commodities that they had to pay a lot of uh, chemical companies a lot, a lot of money to spray with chemicals and then sell, sell them out through a, a distributor, a middle person. Um, Michelle's worked a lot with them and we've worked with some of those in the clinic. We might talk about some of those in a minute, but one of the ones I really liked was this was, you know, sometimes in law you see an example of somebody really pulling a jujitsu. You know, they take, a, they take the opponent's weapons and use them against them. And one anecdote of the book I didn't want to leave out was the work that you did in the 1990s to get rid of diesel exhaust in New York City. And uh, I just wanted to talk, have you talk a little bit about what's your ad, what was your ad campaign and your ad budget and how did that work? And I'll leave it to either one of you to answer well, that Well, I'll question. start. Um, I, to explain how we wrote the book, I did interviews of the various people that worked at NRDC over the years. We did about 150 or 60 interviews. And it was a wonderful thing to do because John and I were partners, but I did not walk into the office every day. He was there. He was making the decisions. And I knew a lot of the people, but this way I really learned what they were doing professionally. And grew to really respect what had been going on for the last 40 years there as well. And this is, uh, this is a young man, uh, Rich Castle was his name. He lived on the Upper West Side and he rode his bicycle down to NRDC down on 20th Street, down Fifth Avenue every day. And he just was furious with all the diesel fuels and the hard smoke on Fifth Avenue. And he kept saying, why doesn't somebody do something about this? And he realized, well, I got to do something about this. Now they didn't they weren't really budgeted for much money. They didn't have a lot of scientific, you know, information to work on specifically. So he decided to do an ad campaign. And he got a uh, pro bono and an advertising firm gave made a sign that was to be put on the back of a bus and it said it is safer to stand in front of this bus than in the back. Right, right where the diesel was. <laughs> so he actually was able to sell it to the MTA because it, they they didn't have much money, so they bought a cheap space. And uh, they didn't really pay a lot of attention to it. Well, when they finally paid attention to what the sign said, they said, oh, no, we're not going to put this on the bus. And so NRDC's litigation team, Mitch Bernard, who's this wonderful litigator who's been there forever, uh, said, hey, it's a First Amendment case. And they brought that and got enormous publicity, which they would never have gotten if they just put the sign on the bus in the first place. <laughs> so uh, Rich Castle has a motto, think big, start small. And that's what he did. And now they're dirty diesel campaigns and cleanups. Well, Pataki also was very helpful yeah. in that. Uh, but in Africa and South America and big cities in America, it's a great success story. Well, anyway. particularly Los Angeles, San Francisco, Washington, Chicago, all, really diesel, dirty diesels are gone and their dirty diesels are going from the trucks. New diesel motors are being made. Uh, they've cleaned up the gas, 95, uh, the uh, diesel fuel, 95, 98% from those days. And uh, why they didn't do it sooner is, uh, you know, is unfathomable. But uh, you know, New York City at Fifth Avenue is clean. It's the first time in you know, my life. You can go down Fifth Avenue, stand at the library before you walk down and the air is clean. And th these kind of accomplishments obviously were in hand in glove with some of the legislative accomplishments that you mentioned earlier. Uh, before coming in today, we sort of talked a little bit amongst ourselves about whether or not the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act could be enacted in law in the Congress today. Um, and uh, I know that's probably a provocative question and maybe an easy one, but I'm going to go ahead and lob it and see what you all want to say about it. Would the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act be enacted today if they were if they were brand new laws and put before the Congress? Well, I guess you'd have to think about it in two ways. You'd have to, if you want to think about it the way the Republicans and Democrats are split right now, the answer is no. But if you want to think about what the air was like in 1970 and put that in 2010, yeah. it would be black, it would be like we're in China. <laughs> And the rivers would be flowing, and some of them would be burning. And so we might even get stronger rules and regulations. One of the things that's happened is the, the legislators that get elected, 
have no memory of what it was like. They've completely lost the memory, and one of the things that we have failed to do is remind them that history repeats itself, and we try to do that, uh, and, it, and we're very successful when we meet someone who is receptive to hearing it, but really it is a lack of memory. You, you just meet some of these senators, and you have a conversation with them about clean air. It's as though they're from Mars, uh, and they probably think, you know, I'm from, <laughs> I don't know where. Yeah, yeah Venus. You're from, <laughs> you're from Venus. Well, and, and I, I thought along those lines when I was thinking about it, maybe the example would be if you ate a liverwurst sandwich on the Hudson River now, you would think we don't have a problem. Right. If you sent them instead to eat it on the Mekong, they might think that there is something that needs to be done. And, and a lot of times baseline or has Beijing. moved. Beijing. Or Beijing. The Yangtze in Beijing. Yeah, or yeah, I guess it's not there, but the, uh, yeah, Beijing, breathe the air in Beijing um, is, is really something when you think about what they had to do for yeah. the Olympics. Uh, could I come in on that actually yeah, on another uh, landmark uh, law that was passed and that is the Endangered Species Act which is I've been much more involved in that. I think that's a harder sell because people don't value wildlife and the web of nature and biodiversity as much as they understand clean air and clean right. water. Uh, it is true that probably every Congress that's come through there's always been a bill to get rid of the Endangered Species Act they haven't yet, but I think that that is something that could never have gotten passed today. Today. For sure. And uh, that's one good thing about environmental lawyers. I think you have to have an environmental lawyer at your elbow all the time <laughs> when you're working on environmental issues. Well, Brenda was the uh, cha uh, chair of the board of the Defenders of Wildlife for a number of years, so she knows from what she speaks. Yeah. Well, I want to talk, talk a little bit about the role that legal education, and particularly clinical legal, legal education, Great. has played, and also what you think the future of that is. Because obviously we know at the very beginning, as Jim was saying, that was part of the DNA of the uh, project that was started, um, that uh, grew into Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund, and then into, I guess, in turn into what we now call Earth Justice. But NRDC has also had association with clinics early on, and, and I just wondered if, what your thoughts are about how environmental law clinics integrate into this field. What are their importance, and what do you see for the future? Well, first of all, uh, NRDC, I, I was asked in 1970 or 71, I'm not sure, to start a clinical uh, law program at NYU, and uh, we continue to have that clinical program at, N at NRDC now 41 or two years later. Uh, and we have about 10 students a semester. Uh, and, you know, 40 years times 20 <laughs> tells you how many students have come through the NRDC clinical program. And, uh, and they've worked on climate issues. They've worked on ocean issues. Uh, they're working on the fracking uh, issues. They've been on uh, the, the XKL pipeline and, uh, and work down in the Gulf and are working in the Arctic. So when you think about the experience they get at a place like NRDC, it really uh, can make their careers. And the, and the thing that is most fun about my life now is no matter where I go, somebody has been in that clinic or worked for NRDC uh, you know, as part of, of this 40, and Michelle. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's, really, it's really powerful. And I, and I, I just wanted to say, it, it, Duke has been an enormous contributor to the history of NRDC. David Noble is a graduate sometime after uh, um, the, our class of 62. But he's a financial supporter, and, and he is a lobbyist who comes in and lobbies with NRDC on all of these important issues. He comes to every single session we have in Washington. And I could go around and talk about a lot of people who are in the family of NRDC who have become huge uh, allies of the environment, and I think a lot of that's due to these kinds of programs. I mean, I, you know, I've, we really benefited from a the Duke family and a, and a commitment that a lot of Duke people have deep down about these issues. And uh, to, to build on that, I know that one of the things that's been key has been the involvement of the law school, 
the professors that are here, the faculty that are here, the deans that are here, and also the students. And I'll brag on her because she won't want to brag on herself. But Michelle Nolan, when she was here, uh, was one of the pioneering students to implement the joint degree program between the Nicholas School of the Environment and the Law School. And was also one of the founders of the Duke Environmental Law and Policy Forum. Uh, and we found out that Jim served on that board, the initial board of the Duke and Law Environmental Law and Policy Forum. DELF continues uh, it, to this day as one of the things that integrates between the functions of the law school and the Nicholas School of the Environment. I mean, we're in two separate buildings. We're down the street from each other. But the clinic is one place where the students from both university, both, uh, both, um, the, both schools are working together in teams in an interdisciplinary fashion. And that allows us to get this working between the different disciplines as part of the law school experience. I know one of the things when I got out of law school that I really had not experienced in environmental law was this working with experts from the environmental sciences. And it took me quite a few years to <coughs> understand how to speak the language of engineers and biologists. Uh, and that was a bit of a culture shock um, for me and for them, I think, it was, as it was for them learning the language of the law. But we have students from the Nicholas School of the Environment come in and learn some of the language of the law, so they'll be ready when they go out. One of my students I see out here in the audience is having been spending this semester learning a lot about uh, how it is that lawyers speak. And so, you know, one of the things we were talking about before is how is it that we can use this as an integrating principle around the university? You, you reminded me that in the 90s, you had contacted the president of the university to point out that the environment could uh, issues related to the environment could be an integrating principle across the entire university. You want to tell a little bit about what your vision was then? And we see, we're seeing it start to come to fruition for sure. Well, yes, I, I, uh, Patricia worked with me on this. I mean, I always felt as though Duke had so much to offer that why couldn't it become like Yale and have a really strong environmental program and a uh, and and not just a conservation program, but a real environmental program with the business school, the religion school, the medical school, uh, the engineering school. And so I wrote, we wrote a letter, and we looked at all of the places that were doing it, and, you know, and what we felt, how strongly we felt about it. Uh, and I don't know whether the letter went into the ether, but I kept the letter, and, <laughs> and I have used it in talking to lots of people. I, I know I sent it to Dean Levy, and. Uh, and I've used it over at the, uh, at the Nicholas School. And, and lo and behold, we're watching this happen. Yeah. I mean, really, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, Duke is becoming one of the most important places building towards an integrated program of educating students about the importance of environment in every aspect of their life. And I think it is in every aspect. I think climate change, uh, should be something that everybody who cares about the world and business thinks about. And the medical school, you know, how many of the people at, who are the clients of the medical school have suffered because we haven't given them clean air and healthy water and, and other things? So without going into the details of that uh, letter, I think it had a small impact, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I am really proud of the, of the clinic because they understand the value. So that brings me to the questions yes. that I have. Yes. First of all, what do you need to make this clinical program into something that really can take it way, in, way beyond where it is right now? It's great now, but what do you need to go further? Well, we were talking about this uh, uh, yesterday, and, and I think the, the simple answer to that is better integration around the different um, schools in the campus. We, we envisioned the idea of having postgraduate fellows working in the school of uh, religion, in the medical school, in the business school, in the school of the environment, and in fact that's where we would like to start. For some time now we've been uh, proposing and talking to foundations and looking at the possibility of getting funding for that. It's yet to come to fruition, but our vision is to have a postgraduate fellow at the Nicholas School and that person will be a direct link of the science to the, the students at the Nichols School into the law school and bring that component squarely in there because we can we work interdisciplinary interdisciplinarity in everything that we do, but there's location is such a critical factor yeah. and we can't be at all places at once and having a presence a physical presence a person 
over in each one of these um, these schools long term is the thing that will help us to integrate that. So NRDC has over a hundred scientists. Yeah. So that everybody that you're working with it has more scientists than lawyers, and they are working together. And what's missing here is the ability to have the team integrated. And Michelle, I, I know that you feel as though if you were able to get the postdoc and, uh, and at various of these schools, I would guess engineering and yeah. Nicholas would be your start. Yeah. So those are, that's something that could make a huge difference. And it's not a very expensive item. I think it really is something that needs to be brought to the attention of the authorities, Dean Levy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and with that, I'll just say that the... <laughs> the, um, the alumni. Yeah. And the alumni. I was going to say, the, uh, the other aspect of that, which has been critical, is we've enjoyed a lot of alumni support, and we've used that towards helping to build a fund to help us with litigation expenses. But that's another piece of the puzzle. Uh, to help students learn what it's really like to practice law or environmental science, they have to be able to conduct water quality testing. They have to be able to go out and check turbidity in a stream, not using my clumsy old turbidimeter, which is like a three-foot-tall tube. Um, but something that's actually like a, a measuring instrument they might use in the field. So those are some of the things we've already gotten some support for, but that's a continuing need every year. Just, just Well, again, <clears throat> if you send out the young people to do research and you want them to do and become really effective at it, you've got to give them simple tools that they can use and, and connect them with people who have experience. Otherwise, they're really redoing the, the wheel. Uh, and uh, so I was talking... Uh, to the team here, and, and they're talking about a need of twenty-five or fifty thousand dollars for testing and all of the scientific things that would enhance the litigation program. So those are two simple things: help us uh, reach into the other departments to get postdocs that are assigned here to be a part of the of the clinic, and the second is to think about how we can get some funds for the clinic so that the students really have the tools to make break, big breakthroughs on these uh, cases, particularly public health issues. And I wanted to make sure to leave some time for questions from the audience, because I'm sure some of you may have questions that you'd like to ask for this panel. Yeah. What's that? No, well. No, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, environmental programs in China. Yeah, we're, we're very active in China. We have a... Yeah, the, the question was, is NRDC active in China? I actually had on my list, I just didn't get to it. But yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so we have, we have about 40 people working in China, in Beijing, and moving around to the most, the big economic centers. Uh, and the programs are really about bringing efficiency to the energy system, which they're very welcoming of. And a regulatory program that would work in China as uh, something that NRDC is quite expert in. Uh, and uh, we have a, a long history of working in China, including the wife of uh, the present ambassador, who is a longtime NRDC uh, lawyer. Uh, and uh, so she, is, uh, she has run the program there. Uh, and uh, so I would say that our work is to try to get American companies to clean up their act uh, in terms of manufacturing process. That's the Walmarts and the Gaps and the others that get goods from China uh, and the working on energy. Uh, we're not, we, we are a licensed organization in China. Uh, we don't engage in any political activity, however, because we would be uh, soon not welcome there. Uh, and, but uh, about 90% of the staff are Chinese uh, lawyers. Other questions? Yes. John, I know you live upstate because I actually met you in the Catskill area near Roscoe. So I have some particular interest in the uh, New York State Local Waterfront Revitalization Program, the LWRP, which is, affects a lot of localities, including mine in the Marinette, New York. Is that something that you've tracked at all? Because it's just a subject of interest. Well, we, we have people at NRDC who have tracked it, but I haven't. So it's a, it's a hard one for me to really give you any good answers about. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. So um, 
Thoughts on the future of environmental law? Where, where are we heading? Uh, uh, I mean, well, I, I guess what, I, what I'd say is that, uh, first of all, we should think about whether or not in these darker days we're effective. And if, you know, we, we lost the climate bill. Uh, when we were all fighting for the climate bill, everybody would have said that the environmental movement was strong and healthy. But losing that climate bill was a big setback. Uh, and so a lot of energy has switched to the grassroots. Bill McKibben, others who are leading people in marches around the, the world and the country. Uh, fracking has become a, a, a call uh, to a lot of young people and demonstrations on the pipeline in Washington led to 1,600 people being arrested, including Gus Speth and I'm sure Duke students. There were over 100 people from NRDC that were arrested. Uh, uh, and then you take a look at what's really happening. You know, we need to make progress on climate, and this is only one measure. Obama passed a 55-mile fleet average program on cars. That'll reduce gas usage by 50% by 2025. That's an enormous breakthrough. The two long litigations that NRDC has been involved in with other organizations, one on mercury, one on carbon, uh, cases that went to the Supreme Court and now are being enforced requiring reductions of carbon at power plants and re, uh, requiring redu reductions of mercury, meaning that dirty power plants are going to be shut down. Uh, we're watching funding for efficiency and renewables taking place at a, at a uh, larger rate than any of us ever thought would happen, even though we've had a couple of bankruptcies and other things that are troubling. But you know, I, I think, from my point of view, are just part of the bumps in the road as we change the direction. So there's a lot more progress that's happening, and it doesn't happen unless you have people who do what uh, Sierra Club Legal and NRDC and others do. Uh, the 55 mile a gallon fleet average would not have happened if it had not been directly delivered into Obama's hands by staff that uh, are connected with these organizations. Yes. Does in front. everybody in this room know how serious fracking is? Could you talk about it for a second, or maybe everybody already knows what what, what fracking? What, yeah, well, what fracking. Have you, natural gas is, uh, you know, believed to be a transition fuel, and uh, there's been a process discovered called fracking that uh, uh, releases natural gas in a in a way that uh, makes it economic, uh, and the. Uh, the problem is that it, it is the way that it's being done so far is worrisome to lots of people about the kinds of chemicals that are left in the ground and what's happening to drinking water. Uh, it's also really about communities. To come in and frack a community means it becomes an industrial town or industrial area. You can't do fracking, which takes over a million gallons per frack of water, fresh water, put in the ground with hundreds of chemicals. Uh, you have to bring it in by truck, uh, and that, you know, 20,000 gallons per truckload. You know, and uh, some wells get fracked six, seven times. So you're seeing lots of industrialization in, in uh, important places. And that's where the opposition is coming. The opposition is really grassroots, because everybody who uh, is in the government leadership wants the revenue from the sales of gas uh, from the companies that pay the taxes. And we all are thirsty for energy. And, and if I may interject with that, um, one of the big concerns that we have as a clinic about uh, the, the process of hydraulic fracturing is that um, over the years, many exemptions and loopholes have been carved into the nation's environmental laws that prevent uh, adequate regulatory oversight and any public disclosure um, of the practices employed and the impacts that they have on the environment. So um, the fracking fluids are now exempt from the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. They're defined 
defined um, as a specific exemption from the definition of hazardous waste. They're exempt from the Safe Drinking Water Act. They're exempt from the Clean Water Act in terms of the stormwater runoff from these industrial facilities. So all the very carefully laid environmental uh, you know, network of laws that would protect our natural resources otherwise don't apply for this particular industry. And so for me, that's a very big concern for the communities. I think that's one of the reasons that you see so much grassroots pressure in response to all of this. And for me, what the other thing that it signals in terms of the future of the environmental movement and environmental law is that it's going to have to become much more conversant on economics. Because the only way that this process is considered to be economically viable for the industry is because of the legal exemptions that it enjoys and because it does not have to internalize any of those costs. Those costs are imposed on society at large, and that's what we're seeing the backlash about. I just want to say, I, I think that there's a real democratic issue here, and that is, can the voice of the people who live in the communities be heard on this issue? Or are they going to be pushed out by money and... Uh, you know, and the absolute belief that it's essential to take this oil out of the ground at uh, the risk to this, these communities. It gives not in my backyard a good name again. <laughs> and, and with that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to exercise undemocratic privilege and cut off questioning in my role because of the time. And in fairness to the next speakers, I do want to thank John. And my thank you today is a, a collection of Dean Fox Mordecai's uh, sayings. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.